What's going on, people? Welcome to the King's Monologue. And today I've got another documentary for you, actually. Um, I'm not going to talk too long because I want to get straight into it. But I just want to give you a little bit of background into how this documentary came about. So I was actually producing a short that I was going to do um, that was centered around the facelift. I'm not going to give too much away in terms of a spoiler, but the facelift is something that's in the Meduneta, which is the ancient Egyptian language, I should say, um, that we know as hieroglyphs. And I was going to do a short just based purely on that. But then I had a meeting a few weeks ago with a friend of mine who also happens to be an Egyptian Nubian. And they was telling me of the need for me to really get into hieroglyphics. And I, I didn't really understand it. Well, I was like, listen, you have to start writing, you know, using the language of the gods, the Medinetta, the language of the gods. And I thought, you know, that's a really interesting challenge. So I sort of took them up on it. I haven't fully taken them up on it, but I thought, let me, let me at least start that process. So I started reading lots of books that I find really quite interesting. So I purchased the, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is good kind of book there i obviously have this one history and testimony of language by christopher Eret. that's a really excellent book for those of you who haven't got that um it doesn't look specifically at the medianeta but it looks at you know language across africa as a whole and then um i got this which is the egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary which is excellent by wallace Budge. this really is a fantastic starter place for you to go and this one as well this is um egyptian language and easy lessons so these are the books that were really good for me to get started i haven't obviously finished reading all of them but i managed to get a really good grounding from these books and what started off as something really small as a short started to progress into something more of a project now this video or this documentary that you're about to see is sort of a culmination of my early introduction into Kemetic hieroglyphics and it really just kind of opened my eyes in terms of how powerful they are and also how African they are. The, the Africanicity of ancient Egyptian language, writing, fauna and flora is just amazing and it's, it's all over the language. Their culture permeated in the language and so that's one of the things that I really wanted to focus on in this documentary and I hope in sharing it with you that it kind of comes across that way this will be probably the first in many um, documentaries that I do or at least you know studies I do on the ancient Egyptian language I should say the the Kemetic language but I hope that you find this informative and yeah enjoy this is the hieroglyph for face simplistic and telling but what does it tell us exactly? The depth of a hieroglyphic engraving could range from two millimeters to one inch. The painstaking process of communicating language, passing laws and teaching comedic principles through the use of pictures was never rushed, haphazard or accidental. Inasmuch, the consistency in the appearance of characters was not subject to handwriting quirks like the demotic shorthand script that followed. Hieroglyphics acted as a pictorial lingua franca and were largely unchanged for at least 3,000 years. One of the most expressive hieroglyphs in Kemetic script is the one used for face. Like many of the glyphs in the Meduneta, this would have been more than just a form of lexicon. It would have been a reflection of the surrounding culture and climate around which their written language was developed. Take for instance the choice of the spotted eagle owl, or Bubo Africanus, native to South Africa as the character to represent the phonetic M, that was a cultural reference. Their choice of the cape vulture, or gyps coprotheres, as a representation of moot, also endemic to southern Africa, was a cultural reference. Their choice of the crocodile and the blue lotus flower, that are both prolific along the Nile, is an obvious cultural reference to an abundant symbol of daily life along the Nile Valley. Their choice of the ostrich feather as a representation of Maat, and also a general phonetic glyph used in several words, is a cultural reference to the world's largest bird, found indigenously throughout continental Africa. The sacred African ibis, a regal and unique bird, indigenous to the southern portion of Africa, was chosen as the symbol to represent Tehuti, later venerated as Thoth, god of wisdom. This, once again, was a cultural reference when they chose the cobra, a serpent with multiple species prolific, once again to southern Africa, as a representation for the word goddess, they were once again making a cultural reference. In fact, I could go on about how every animal and plant represented in the Medu Neta is native not only to the African continent, 
but significantly to the southern portion of the continent. Certainly a language formed from a foreign culture would see reference made from locality of that diverse ecosystem. That logic alone supports the continental African origin of Kemet. Even the representation of men wearing loincloths for the illustration of numerous verbs is entirely appropriate considering the culture they had. In so much, we can consider the face glyph would be a cultural generalization of the average person when the language was founded. Notice their choice of face is expressive and clear, leaving no doubt to their self-perception as a population. Bear in mind they would have been in exposure to the same full spectrum of physical phenotypes in the ancient world, perhaps even greater variety than what we see today. So logically, they would have chosen a face that is representative of their population at the point in which the written language of Medu Neta, or hieroglyphics, was established. In spite of the baseless arguments suggesting a non-African origin for the nubio kemetic Nile Valley civilizations, the face glyph clearly bears no resemblance to modern Levantine or European populations. It has short-shaped hair, only possible with a naturally kinky texture, a broad nose and full lips. It, without a doubt, bears a striking resemblance once again to modern southern and central African populations. This is supported by the cultural, linguistic and genetic continuity of the said region. Notice they didn't choose this, nor did they choose this, or even this to represent their face. They instead chose this. The Kemetic people in the establishing of the Medu Neta left clear indications about their socio-cultural and geographic origins. What becomes abundantly clear for all who have studied the hieroglyphics is that the only geographic location that can lay claim to the complete combination of flora, fauna, religion and physical personifications exhibited within the foundations of the Meduneta is continental Africa, more specifically its southern non-Mediterranean portion. It is impossible that the language had its origin anywhere but the interior of the African continent, as demonstrated by the visualizations and traditions that formulate the lexicon. Proponents of this fact include Wallace Budge, one of the most prominent minds responsible for modern translations of Kemetic hieroglyphics. Budge argued that the religion of Osiris had emerged from an indigenous African people, there is no doubt, he said, that the beliefs examined herein are of indigenous origin, Nilotic or Sudani, in the broadest signification of the word, and I have endeavoured to explain those which cannot be elucidated in any other way, by the evidence which is afforded by the religions of the modern peoples who live on the great rivers of East, West and Central Africa. He also acknowledged that in the religions of modern African peoples, we find that the beliefs underlying them are almost identical with those ancient Egyptian ones. It follows that they are the natural product of the religious mind of the natives of certain parts of Africa, which is the same in all periods. In support of this, the esteemed Greek historian Diodorus Siculus, who was also a contemporary eyewitness of ancient Egyptians and Ethiopians, recorded the following observation. They say also that the Egyptians are colonists sent out by the Ethiopians, and the larger part of the customs of the Egyptians are, they hold, Ethiopian, the colonists still preserving their ancient manners. For instance, the belief that their kings are gods, the very special attention which they pay to their burials, and many other matters of a similar nature, are Ethiopian practices, while the shapes of their statues and the forms of their letters are Ethiopian. For of the two kinds of writing which the Egyptians have, that which is known as popular, demotic, is learned by everyone, while that which is called sacred, hieroglyphics, is understood only by the priests of the Egyptians, who learn it from their fathers as one of the things which are not divulged. But among the Ethiopians everyone uses these forms of letters, and having the same dress and form of staff, which is shaped like a plough and is carried by their kings, who wear high felt hats which end in a knob at the top. We must now speak about the Ethiopian writing which is called hieroglyphic among the Egyptians, in order that we may omit nothing in our discussion of their antiquities. There is no other place on the planet with the combination of species represented in the language of the gods other than Africa. And in addition to that, 
There is no other continent with phenotypic variants that aggregates to form such a beautiful and expressive face. Thank you for joining me on The King's Monologue, a place where we are undeterred in our pursuit for historical truth by challenging centuries of Eurocentric ideology that has falsified the global worldview. Thanks to my entire Patreon family, with special thanks to my production team. If you'd like to support the future productions on the channel and help to fund further research, you can find a link in the description. Please remember to like and share the content. And obviously, if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to The King's Monologue so you don't miss out on further reconstructions, commentaries, reactions, shorts and documentaries. So that's the documentary. Thank you for tuning in, as always. Essentially, when I started this process, it was supposed to be really short, and in the end, it's ended up being a documentary that's taken the bare minimum of two weeks of my life to put together. It's been really enjoyable, and I'm not gonna lie, I love the process, but at the same time, it can be quite taxing. So I hope it's worthwhile. Please do share it, because if I put this out and you know, it only gets a few hundred hits or something like that, and people don't really take to it, I will be absolutely heartbroken and devastated. Um, so, you know, appease, you know, get out there, get let other people see what ancient Egypt was as a civilization, how it connects to the rest of Africa and how important it is for us to understand the Kemetic culture. If you're able to and if it's comfortable, please do, you know, take the initiative to support me on Patreon. It would be a, a massive, massive boost for me. Um, I really am grateful to the Patreons that have the support that they provide me with. Um, we do have a really quite nice close knit community um, in Patreon and I'm hoping to grow it. So please do, you know, get involved if you're able to. I've just actually um, created a new shirt called my favorite black tee. I'm going to be wearing it in my next video. I actually ordered one, but it hasn't arrived yet, but I'll be wearing it in my next video. So yeah, anything you can do to support, always very, very happy. But the, obviously the biggest support you can do is hit that like button, subscribe if you're not subscribed, um, and make sure that you're just basically tuned in for the next video that I produce. Thank you for joining me on the King's Monologue, and I'll see you on the next one.